This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and here's another Audiotronics 300A classroom phonograph. This is a tube model, but it's one of the later ones. Uh, it's date coded 1968 on the inside. It looks a bit similar to the older models, but you can tell they were trying to modernize them a little bit. It has a black metal speaker grill. The the uh, case covering is dark brown as opposed to the lighter brown and gray colors that the older ones were. And it has black knobs with gold accents as opposed to the old, older looking white knobs. It uses a single 6T9 compactron tube that's, I believe, the equivalent of a separate a 6AV6 and a 6AQ5 as far as separate tubes go. Now this one works, Neil, but it has some issues and I'm thinking it's probably a bad tube socket. It will play, but it makes static and popping sounds. And I've had this for years and I think I substituted the tube and that didn't help. Tried, tried cleaning the tube socket. You hear what it's doing. Tried cleaning the tube socket and that helped briefly, but works good, but when it starts all that popping and crackling, then that's not too good, and I don't want to, I don't want to leave it on like that, because I don't want the, the loud spikes from that to damage the speaker. And here's a new ceramic compactron socket that I ordered off of eBay, but before I change it, I'm going to double check everything. Make sure there's no wires shorting or make doubly sure the tube's good because this is not going to be easy to change and I don't want to change it just to find out that that's not exactly the problem. Here's the amplifier. As you can tell, not much to it. And at one time, this 6T9 tube was just another worthless TV compactron tube that nobody wanted. You could buy them for a couple of dollars. But... All of the uh, audio grade tubes were starting to get expensive, so the audiophiles discovered that the uh, the 6T9 compactron tube could be bought cheaply, and they could make amplifiers out of them that were based on them. And then first thing you know, the dollar fifty, two dollar 6T9 suddenly became a twenty dollar tube. So hopefully, I won't have to replace it. And here's the underside of the chassis. Not not much to it there. Now if we look here, we'll notice this is a bit rat's nesty looking. And I want to double check all this and just make sure none of those bare wires are touching anything. In fact, it might be a good idea to put some spaghetti sleeving over some of those leads to make sure they don't touch anything. And then if nothing's touching and if the tube turns out to be good, then we'll just have to replace this socket. Not looking forward to it, but if it comes to it, then we'll just have to do it. Alright, I'm testing the tube. Good emission, no grid leakage. Good emission, no grid leakage. And no shorts. And yes, I've already tapped on the tube as I was rotating it through the the uh, shorts test and the light didn't flicker or stay on so we're going to say this tube is good and looking at it doesn't look to be any tungsten burn off on the top of the tube so I figure this is either a a new tube or one that's got very low hours on it although I know that don't mean anything I've seen brand new tubes out of the carton check wonky so but at least we know this tube's not one with 10 million hours on it and I've looked at all this and I don't see anything getting touchy-feely with anything so 
bad as I hate to, I think we're going to have to change this tube socket out. It seems to be the culprit. So we'll just, I'm going to take a picture of the schematic diagram that they were so thoughtful to provide us with and take a picture of this just to be on the safe side. We'll carefully unsolder everything and then drill the rivets out and then install our new tube socket and then connect everything back up. And hopefully that will take care of the intermittent popping and cracking sounds. I'm spot checking the resistors. There's one reading 6.9K. However, it's supposed to be orange-orange red. It's 3.3K according to my uh, resistance color code chart, so that one needs to go. And then we have this 5. Point, or excuse me, 560K. It's the uh, resistor for the uh, control grid of the output tube section of this 69 compactron and it's reading 623k so that one needs to go we have these 250 ohm resistors one's the cathode bias for the output section of this tube and the other one is in the power supply both of them read 158 ohms that's not that's not out of tolerance but I'm probably going to change them anyway, change them over to a film resistor that will be less likely to drift. These carbon composition resistors that are used in high demand areas such as the power supply or the cathode of an output tube tend to get stressed a lot more therefore they'll come near drifting up in value whereas the film resistors usually don't do that when they go bad they usually just open and when one of those opens it's usually because something shorted and caused it to open well just for fun before we rip this apart we're gonna we're gonna check our voltages just to see what effect resistors that have gone up in value has if any and we're gonna check our voltages based on the uh, schematic first we're gonna look at pin 2 which is the plate of the driver section they want to see 140 volts, so we have our test socket adapter plugged in. This makes it much easier to check voltage in these things, and we'll fire it up and see what we get. And for a speaker, I'm using an old one that's no good. It has a still produces sound, but it's got a warped cone and a dragging voice coil. And it just doesn't sound good. So if this thing starts acting up and sending spikes down the line if it's going to blow up something I'd rather it ruin this one or finish ruining this one than the one I've got that's actually good so let's let's get to this and we're getting 278 there which is high I would think with the feed resistor in that line being double its rated value it would be lower there so all right, scratch that last reading. Uh, this is not making good contact at all. And the only way I was able to get it to make contact was to uh, twist the tube. And now I'm getting 151 on the uh, plate. So that's, I believe that's a few volts higher than the schematic indicated value. And we're going to do the similar for the other pins and see what we get. I tried to print the schematic out from the picture I took of the one inside the case and I think my color ink cartridge is about shot so scratch that idea so I just crudely drew one out uh, this is not going to win any awards but I can make it out alright I went down through and listed all the voltages on the driver tube, the plate, schematic calls for 140, we measured 152, cathode 1.25, we measured 1.3, on the output section, plate 265 volts, we got 292 there, which is a good bit higher. On the screen grid, 260 is what the schematic calls for, we measured 275. Cathode, 7 volts, we got 6.9, so that's close enough to 7 volts to, say, 7 volts. 
you know this is strictly just for entertainment purposes now when I overhaul this thing which means replacing anything that looks a little bit out of whack we're going to go back through and remeasure the voltages and see what we get then all right now that we have our schematic and everything readings taken let's tear this thing apart and get and get on with it and yeah I really do like these tube socket test adapters it makes it a lot safer and a lot easier to test voltages on a tube socket instead of probing around under the chassis in a in a rat bed where it's possible to make a slip of your meter probe and short something out and get your own little personal 4th of July thing going on there. And here's our old defective socket. I'll check these components and may remove them. I don't know. It's probably just easier just to install new ones rather than try to get these off and put them on the new socket. I doubt our new socket is going to have provisions around the uh, mounting ring for grounding. So what we'll probably have to do is just directly solder any components that need to be grounded directly to the chassis and that should take care of that. Well I should have known it wasn't going to be that simple and what I mean is this socket is just slightly too big it won't just drop right in the original hole so I'm going to have to enlarge that hole which could be a bit of a pain in the butt considering I don't have the right stuff to do it with and also the mounting is not oriented like this one was whereas you see how this pin on this socket here pin 12 was oriented right there right above that particular mounting hole which that's not the case on this one but that's no problem I can I can drill new mounting holes on the chassis I just need to enlarge it so this thing will fit in there properly and then I can install the thing I don't know why they don't make these parts universal but you know, I don't know why I think a lot of things I think on that note, it's starting to get a little chilly out here in the workshop and getting a little late too, so I think we're going to table this until tomorrow or the next day or whenever I choose to come back out here and get on this. And then I'll come up with something to enlarge that hole a little bit and so we can mount our new tube socket. And then we'll go from there. Alright. It's another day and it's warmer out here and we're back on the Audiotronics. I have the tube socket physically mounted to the chassis. I had to enlarge the hole just a little bit and I'll admit that I used non-conventional means for doing that. Just took a drill bit, old drill bit, put it in the drill and ran it along the perimeter of the original hole to grind off a, enough metal to to allow the tube socket to fit. Fortunately I didn't have to take much off. And then I lined the tube socket up where the pins would be physically in the same place where the original tube socket was, but unfortunately the holes didn't line up on the new tube socket, but that was no problem. I just drilled new holes and bolted it in place and now it's there and it's not going anywhere. And speaking of mounting, uh, before we're done here, we're going to have to remount this power transformer. It's riveted to the chassis, but as you can see, it's very loose. And I ran into one of these one time where the rivet actually broke loose and the power transformer was flopping, so we don't want to take the chance of that happening. So before we're done with this, we're going to drill these rivets out and out and bolt this in where it won't won't go anywhere. Here it is from the underside. Now comes the task of repositioning everything and connecting everything back up and all that good stuff. Like I've already said, this tube socket doesn't have the ground tab provisions around the mounting ring, so whatever needs to be grounded, we're just going to have to ground it directly to the to the chassis itself. All right, I think we have everything done. 
I looked over my work and I don't see any obvious wiring errors so I'm going to do a resistance check from the B plus line to ground make sure there's no obvious short and if there's not we're going to run the smoke test and see what happens oh and just for another little bit of entertainment you know we always hear from the audio files how you should never use disk capacitors in audio work you should only use film capacitors well I don't know that that may be the case in higher end stereo equipment but I've seen disk capacitors used a lot in these little record players like this and they seem to still sound okay but while I had it all apart, I switched most of them over to film caps, except for a 10 picofarad cap in the feedback circuit. I didn't have a film cap or a silver mica cap that low, so I just used the original disc capacitor. And using these film capacitors allowed me to make the rebuild look a little bit neater looking anyway, so we'll just fire it up and and see if I can tell any difference between the sound of the disc capacitors and the film capacitors. Alright, it's passing the click test from the cartridge, so let's put it back in the case and connect the good speaker and see if it works. <laughs> As I suspected, I really can't tell any difference, so maybe in hi-fi stereo tube amplifiers, maybe so, but in something like this or a radio, I don't imagine you're going to be able to tell any difference between disc capacitors or, or film capacitors. Just use whatever you have on hand. Now the next order of business is to drill these rivets out that hold the power transformer and bolt it in place so it won't be wobbling like this. Alright, here it is bolted in place and it's not wobbling now. It's in there to stay. Now I thought I heard a little undesirable noise coming from the speaker and I can see why. It's torn right there. And it's also torn over here on the other side, so we'll try to glue that back together and see how it sounds. It just so happens I have a couple of 6x9 speakers on order that should be here tomorrow if unless United Partial Smashers screws up. <laughs> Alright, there we go. Patched the speaker up, and I need to get a new cartridge, because the one in here, the 78 side, is the only side that's any good. Of course, I'll just keep that one for use in some of the junky-looking 78 players that I fix up. needs a new idler wheel too. I've cleaned and lubricated this, but the old wheel is just worn out. It just hadn't got a lot of torque, so we'll order one of those and order some bulbs to replace the lamp, the indicator lamp, and order a new 89T cartridge, and this thing ought to be ready to go. And I just got my two 6x9 speakers from Parts Express so we can get this other Audiotronics fixed up and one other record player. I probably should have ordered four of these because it seems like I run into these that are bad on a fairly regular basis. And here we go. This is basically the kind I've been looking for. Of course, I wish it didn't say that on it, but I know pretty much anything electronic manufactured over the past 25 years is going to say that on it. So. But beggars can't be choosy. Now I'm going to have to 
modify this connector here. It doesn't have the standard type connector, but we can do something about that. Alright, here's our speaker attached to the mounting board, and I added a terminal strip here and connected it to the where the original plug is, and that way we can connect our original wires from our amplifier to this without any problems. Alright, there it is. It's working and it sounds pretty good, but I think the I think the tube model has more bass than this one does. Now that could be the difference in speakers. That's just it is what it is. It's not like these are It's not like these old school tube style speakers like these two that are bad are growing on trees, so I pretty much have to use whatever I can get. even playing with all the trash and scratches that's on it. Yeah, I still need to do a little mechanical work on this one. But yeah, if you have an old radio or phonograph that uses an old school style 6x9 speaker, then given what's available today, I don't really think you could go wrong with the order in the one from Parch Express. It, it seems to do okay. I've got another solid state record player that needs a speaker, and it'll probably get the other speaker, so we'll just see how it goes. But like I've already said, Finding old school, high efficiency, low power 6x9 speakers is getting kind of tough, so you pretty much have to take whatever you can get your hands on. And yeah, I see the old school ones on eBay for a ludicrous price, but I'm not paying $40, 50 $60 for a, for a speaker to put in a record player or a radio that's probably not even worth that much to begin with. Okay, I said that I would recheck the voltages after the overhaul to see what changes were noted, if any. All right, on the plate of the driver tube, schematic calls for 140, pre-rebuild 152, post-rebuild 163. All right, cathode of the driver tube, schematic calls for 1.25. Pre-rebuild 1.3, post-rebuild 1.4, so that didn't change much. On the output tube plate, schematic calls for 265. Uh, Pre-rebuild 292, post-rebuild 286, so that went down just a little bit, but still higher than what the schematic calls for. Screen grid, 260 volt on the schematic. Pre-rebuild 275, post-rebuild 285, so that one is a little high too, as expected. All right, cathode, 7 volts schematic, 6.9 volts, pre-rebuild 6.8 volts, post-rebuild, so that's about what we want. Now, as far as these higher than normal plate and screen voltages, there are a variety of reasons for that. It could all have to do with the higher line voltage today than what it was 50 years ago. It could have to do with the condition of the tube itself, even though the tube checks good on a tube tester. It could even have to do with your meter being used. A lot of these voltage readings were taken with 
the equivalent of a equivalent of a Simpson 260 meter, and when you use a digital meter or a vacuum tube bolt meter that has a higher input impedance, you might get different readings than what the schematic calls for. But you know, I know all of the component values are exactly the same as what's on the schematic, and the record player seems to work okay. So we're not going to worry about it. That was just basically for entertainment purposes. When I'm checking voltages on a in a circuit, I really look for something that's way off. Like if it's supposed to have 250 volts and I read 50 volts or 25 volts or zero volts, then that's a reason to reason for alarm. On the other hand, if it's supposed to be 250 volts and I'm reading 325 volts, then that's also reason for alarm too because that generally means the circuit is not placing the proper load on the power supply and you're getting the full B plus voltage there. Alright, I found a cartridge that was dual LP, but one of the LP tips is damaged and I'm using the other side. Need to replace the dial bulb. I think it takes a GE 159, I believe. It's one of those snap-in bulbs. It couldn't be just a regular Type 47 that I have on hand, so I'm going to have to get some of those. And like I said, the idler wheel needs to be changed. This one hadn't got much grip, but it works for now. <coughs> these audiotronics is is the tone control is not just a simple treble cut control you turn it one way it emphasizes the treble and cuts the bass you set it in the middle and it emphasizes the treble and bass frequencies equally and you turn it all the way to the right and it emphasizes the bass and cuts the treble Oh, and one other thing I need to do to this, and I'm going to wait until I take it back apart to replace the bulb, is adjust the pause control. It's a common problem on these uh, that the pause control won't work properly, and there's a screw on the linkage under the turn under the motor board that you have to adjust. You can hear it's just barely stopping and I need to adjust that screw so the brake comes in contact with the turntable better. <laughs> 